Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you have had a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is, is this story that, you know, it's a social media story, a business story, a mental health story, and today it's specifically around Instagram. And if you hadn't heard, Instagram's testing a new feature where they hide the number of likes on a post. They've been piloting this in Australia, Ireland, and Canada. It's also been rumored that one of the next places to participate in this test would be the United States, or at least a small portion of the population there. And in fact, what we ended up seeing over the weekend is that Instagram CEO Adam Masseri officially announced the long rumored plan at a Wired Tech event, and he followed it up on Twitter saying, heads up, we've been testing making likes private on Instagram in a number of countries this year. We're expanding those tests to include a small portion of people in the United States next week, looking forward to the feedback. And as far as why this CEO says that they're testing this, at the Wired 25 conference, he said, it's about young people. The idea is to try to depressurize Instagram, make it less of a competition, and give people more space to focus on connecting with people that they love, things that inspire Inspire them. With him adding, we will make decisions that hurt the business in the short term if they're good for people's well being and health, because it has to be good for the business over the long term. Now, very quickly, to clear up any confusion, because I've seen a lot of, I wouldn't even call it misreporting, it's just people saying stuff on the internet and people going, oh, I can't believe that's real. Instagram is not getting rid of likes altogether. Users will still be able to view their likes themselves, they just won't be displayed publicly anymore. Right? And the reason that's important for a lot of creators out there is engagement is key. Right? And I think that's an important thing to note, whether you're an established person or you're someone that's trying to garner an audience. Right? Having the ability to see your own likes. If you're trying to, to build something up, it allows you to know what's hitting, what's missing. For creators with brand deals, right? You're working with other companies. You still have your numbers, right? The analytics don't just go away. Also, kind of regarding this conversation of, of business versus mental health, for me personally, I think one of the most notable people to speak out on this was Kim Kardashian West. Right, just has a massive Instagram following. Her posts get anywhere between one to three million likes. She has a lot of business through Instagram. And ahead of this official announcement, she said, as far as mental health, I think taking the likes away and taking that aspect away from Instagram would be really beneficial for people. And adding, I know the Instagram team has been having a bunch of conversations with people to get everyone's take on that, and they're taking it really seriously, and that makes me happy. Also of note, on Saturday, we saw Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey praise this move by retweeting Masseri's tweet and adding, great step, but not everyone was happy. For example, you had rapper Cardi B arguing that it's actually the comment section that should be a bigger concern, saying in a video posted to Instagram that she noticed toxic behavior increasing on the platform after users were given the option to like and reply to comments. Yes. Anything is affecting Instagram right now, I really feel is the way that the comments have um have been done or have been changing these past few years because I feel like people been saying the most weirdest shit, been starting the craziest arguments, been starting to waste day all because of comments because they want they want to get to the top. They want to get the most reactions. We also saw Nicki Minaj chiming in on this news, vowing to stop using Instagram altogether. She also argued that the move might be bad for independent artists who use Instagram for power and exposure. Also suggesting, among other things, that Instagram might be hiding likes to manipulate what posts users see on their feed. I've also seen other people claiming that Instagram might be doing this to, to make it so that advertisers start working directly with Instagram more rather than just sponsoring people based off of the numbers they can see publicly. Right, but then you get into this conversation of like, what's the intent there? I, I, I will say on a personal note, I think if that is the goal that, that it will not be that effective. Once again, it appears that all the analytics will still exist on the back end. So if, if a creator wants to work with an advertiser, it's just sharing that information. But ultimately, as far as my opinion on this topic, I, I, have, I have found myself leaning more and more in the favor of, of not showing at least publicly, the number of likes. And I think the fact that it's actually taken me this long to, to, to be of this opinion, I think shows how much, even if I, I try not to, how much of my value and, and my self-worth and the validation is tied to these public numbers, right? And that can't be healthy, but I, I'm also self-aware enough to know I, I exist in kind of this weird, different bubble. I try to stay grounded and connected to my roots, but obviously my life now is so much disconnected from who I was when I was 18, 20. And so that's why with this story, I wanna pass that question off to you. What are your thoughts regarding this specific situation and kind of just the, the hiding of likes in general? Are you for it, against it? Are you somewhere in between? What do you see as the pros and the cons? Any and all thoughts on this, I'd love to see in those comments down below. Then, actually kind of connected in a loose way. We should briefly talk about KSI versus Logan Paul 2. It finally happened over the weekend. And I say that it's connected, well one, because it's this whole crazy spectacle that just happened thanks to social media. But also two, in the build up towards the actual fight, what was one of the weirdest things on DAZN, not Dazen, even though it's spelled that way, they literally did a side by side comparison of how many concurrent viewers their YouTube live streams had. It was kind of a weird thing to show they even ended up asking KSI about it. As 
as both streams were showing. But also not fully surprising because in addition to, you know, I think some people crave to see those numbers to compare. And also I feel like they were showcasing those numbers to kind of explain to actual boxing fans like, hey, this is why this is happening. Or there were likely way, way, way more eyes on the, the actual title defenses that served as the lead up to the two YouTubers fighting each other. Which if somehow you haven't seen up till this point, KSI ended up beating Logan Paul, which some people found controversial. The fight ended up going all six rounds, went to the judges scorecards, which was drastically affected by a two point penalty that Logan Paul accrued. This during a section of the fight where Logan Paul hits KSI with an uppercut. He then hits him a second time while also seeming to hold his head. And then as KSI was dropping to the ground, right, he was a defenseless fighter, uh, Logan Paul tried to strike again. And as the ref pointed out after the match, uh, there is no sort of 12 to six punch in boxing. Logan Paul after the fight saying that he would contest that decision, right? He was saying, you know, why wasn't I given a warning? The ref in the post fight interview, I think gave a really proper explanation. I'll, I'll link to that video down below. And I mean, really just watching the fight, Logan Paul has no one to blame but himself. But I'll also say too, there's something that also seems incredibly appropriate that the, these two essential first time pros boxing as the, as the main event, that fight ended up being decided by a point penalty given due to a breakdown in boxing technical skills. But hey, well technically KSI won, Logan Paul lost, the real winner was probably to zone. They've come out and while not giving specifics, said that this event was a huge success for them. And I mean, just looking at the number of people that were commenting live on social media while it was happening, the, the highlights and the post fight interviews, like what the numbers are for those. I imagine that it was genuinely a big win for them, which I will say, and this is no shade, if you bought a subscription specifically for this fight, this is a friendly reminder to cancel that subscription. But hey, that's ultimately the story. It, it will be interesting to see what happens from here, right? Is this not, I guess not a one and done, but a, a two and done? Will we see new creators doing something similar or was this kind of just lightning in a bottle? I don't know, but if there is one final note that I can hit on with this story, I think regardless of who you were rooting for to win this fight, I personally have to give both of these guys props. One, it takes a lot of guts to put your image and your body on the line like this, but also two, and obviously this extends to the to the KSI Joe Weller fight that, that came before this whole thing, but these two guys from the internet successfully made such a spectacle that the mainstream had to pay attention. Like it or not, like them or not, this is a game changing moment. And we're seeing moments like this and obviously slightly different avenues happening more and more. And I think it's an incredibly exciting time for the space. But that said, that's where I'm gonna end this one. And of course, pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts around the, the fight, the spectacle, any and all things connected to this story? But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome, brought to you by phil.ting.com. So when it comes to cell phone service, a lot of people pay for things they don't actually use. Right, for example, if you're often around stable Wi-Fi or you just don't need a lot of cellular data, why pay for a set monthly data plan? And with Ting, you just pay a fair price for the talk, text, and data that you actually use. So if you use less one month, you pay less. There's no contracts, overage fees, or any other their carrier tricks, it is just Fair. And you can always bring your phone number to Ting too. There's no need to get a brand new one. And with Ting, you get their fantastic nationwide LTE coverage coast to coast. And Ting customers pay on average just $23 per month for their one device. But yeah, the main point here, head on over to phil.ting.com, check your phone's compatibility right now and get $25 off your bill. Plus, just for you beautiful bastards, you can enter an exclusive giveaway for a chance to win a new Moto G7 and Ting swag pack. But you need to hurry because that giveaway ends this week. But main point, click the link, check it out and enjoy. And the first bit of awesome today is if you didn't see John Oliver's piece on slap lawsuits, I one, highly recommend you watch the whole piece. But two, if you only have five minutes, go to about 21 minutes into the video. He and his team deliver the, the most overly produced fuck you uh, I've ever seen. It really makes like any other thing they've done seem kind of low rent gimmick. Then the infographic show gave a shocking psychic predictions that actually came true. Then we got this really awesome video on neutron stars. We got the official teaser for Scoop, the official trailer for Fantasy Island. We got Tiffany Young's tour bus travel routine. And if you wanna see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. Then in what companies are people angry at today news, we had Uber. And that's because in a new interview, the CEO of the company company was being pressed on Saudi Arabia and Jamal Khashoggi. For those unaware, according to reports, Saudi Arabia is the fifth largest investor in Uber. Also, the head of the Sovereign Wealth Fund is on Uber's board. And while getting pressed uh, regarding this whole situation in general and this specific person, we see this happen. He represents and works for a government which you believe had a role in the murder of a journalist who was a U.S. resident. Should that person be on the board of a U.S. company? I think that government uh, said that they made a mistake. Well, they made a mistake and then somebody's dead. Well, listen, it's, it's, it, it's a serious mistake. We've made mistakes too, right? With self-driving uh, and we stopped driving and we're recovering from that mistake. So I think that people make mistakes. It doesn't mean that they can never be forgiven. I think they've taken it seriously. 
the CIA, my kind of, the CIA didn't suggest that they made a mistake and that it was an oversight. Like with self-driving, that was a, basically a bad sensor, correct? This yes. was, the CIA yeah. suggested that the crown prince had a role in ordering an assassination. It's a different thing. You guys didn't intentionally didn't, run somebody over. I didn't read that part of the CIA report. You're, you're obviously deeper in it. And, you know, after that, the interviewer and also people having seen that clip were like, yeah, those are two completely different things. Right, the self-driving car wasn't set to kill a person on the road. Whereas with Jamal Khashoggi, that was the organized, purposeful, ordered, brutal death of an individual. Now, reportedly following that interview, he called soon after to express regret about his word choice. And today we saw the Uber CEO tweet, there's no forgiving or forgetting what happened to Jamal Khashoggi and I was wrong to call it a mistake. And then saying, as I said after the interview, I said something in the moment I don't believe. Our investors have long known my views here and I'm sorry I wasn't clear on Axios. And my personal reaction to this is it just seems like more empty words. Right, it appears that he's backtracking on his words, but where's any action? Right, because the main pressing point, the, the criticism regarding Uber before the CEO decided to just blurt out something stupid was regarding their action, or rather inaction, regarding Saudi Arabia. Right, and so following this, we saw a number of people saying that they were going to boycott Uber, that began to trend, and then more people saw the video. Yeah, ultimately that's a story. It's one part CEO says stupid thing and backtracks, and second part, uh, it's amazing what a few hundred million dollars will do to your, your thoughts and opinions when it comes to the dismemberment of a fucking human being. But also, while there is all this anger around Uber, it, it should be noted that this is not an Uber only issue as far as the, the blind eyes go, whether it be a company or a government. And then let's talk about this huge news coming out of Bolivia around the presidential elections and Evo Morales. And we actually talked about Morales a couple of weeks ago when he won his fourth term as the country's president, although I, I should say won his fourth term. And if you want the full, full detailed version of that, I'll, I'll link to our coverage down below. But here, to kind of give you a quick recap and an understanding, Morales, who's in the Movement for Socialism Party, has been president since 2006. And while the Bolivian presidency is limited to two terms in office, in 2013, Morales pushed for a third term. Following that, we saw Bolivia's highest court then saying that he could, in fact, run for a third term. Then, in 2016, we saw Morales holding a national referendum asking if the country could get rid of the term limit altogether, but there he lost. However, he then went back to Bolivia's highest court and they scrapped term limits. Right, and so following this, you had some people uneasy that Morales decided to run for a fourth term because people were worrying that he was trying to hold on to power. But also to note here, Morales has been a pretty popular president. He's been credited with bringing massive economic growth to Bolivia, as well as significantly reducing poverty and inequality. But when it finally came to last month's election, we saw something very weird. Originally, results showed Morales in a neck and neck race with his opponent, Carlos Mesa. In fact, the race was so close, the country was expected to hold a runoff election. But then all of a sudden, results stopped coming in. We didn't see any more until almost 24 hours later. And when reporting finally started back up, the results showed Morales beating Mesa by just enough to avoid avoid a runoff. And so following what, you know, appears to be a very weird circumstance, you had Mesa and a ton of citizens calling this obvious election fraud. We then saw massive protests in the streets, some peaceful, other people setting fires to government buildings and knocking over statues. At the same time, the Organization of American States announced that it would audit the vote with Morales saying that if the OAS found evidence of fraud, he would then agree to a second round of voting. And that brings us to the updates because yesterday we saw the OAS finally release its report. And in this report, auditors said that they had found clear manipulation of voting. Votes. With auditors going on to say that the voting transmission system had not been 100% monitored. The OAS also saying that at one point information was redirected, therefore auditors couldn't have certainty over the results. Auditors also saying that good practices were not applied to official vote counting, that because the system allowed someone to take control of parts of the process when they were supposed to be secure. Auditors even saying that at one point the system was frozen and fixed in a way that violated essential principles of security. And ultimately the OAS concluded that 78 of the total 333 evaluated vote counts from polling stations showed irregularities. With Auditors noting that the last 5% of votes was especially unusual because it showed a significant increase for Morales and a sharp decrease for Mesa. And following the release of that audit, we saw reports of celebrations in some areas, but also reports of protests continuing to ramp up. In fact, there were also actually reports that protesters had ransacked and burned the homes of some of the senior members of Morales' socialism party. Morales' home was also ransacked. In fact, there were reports that the brother of one senior official was also kidnapped. And in fact, by yesterday afternoon, Mexico's foreign secretary said that the Mexican embassy in La Paz was sheltering 20 of Morales' senior officials, with Mexico also offering Morales political asylum. Yesterday, we also saw heads of Bolivia's armed forces and national police calling on Morales to step down. And later that same day, we saw Morales do just that. He resigned. Though, notably here, he said it was to ease the violence in the streets, saying, we resign because I don't want to see any more families attacked by instruction of Mesa and opposition leader Luis Fernando Camacho. This is not a betrayal to social movements. The fight continues. We are the people, and thanks to this political union, we have freed Bolivia. We leave this homeland free. Mesa 
and Camacho have achieved their objective. Now stop burning the houses of my brothers and sisters. And also saying on Twitter, the cool mongers are destroying the rule of law. Also saying reportedly that a police officer had publicly called for his arrest. But on that note, we also later saw the head of the national police deny that any warrants had been issued for Morales. Also on the other side of this, you had Mesa tweet, to Bolivia, it's people, the young, the women, to the heroism of peaceful resistance. I will never forget this unique day, the end of tyranny. I'm grateful to the Bolivian people for this historic lesson. Long live Bolivia. Also reportedly telling reporters, we shall not permit the ex-president to use the excuse of a coup. This was not a coup. Which, that word coup, uh, there's been a lot of debate around. And after Morales resigned, we saw people chanting, yes, we could, and setting off fireworks. <laughs> That reportedly is police also withdrew from the city of La Paz. Also, like earlier, we saw other instances of violence as some people looted stores, others starting what appeared to be politically motivated fires. You now we've seen a number of reactions from different countries. For example, in addition to offering Morales political asylum, the Mexican president called the situation regrettable. His foreign minister echoing Morales, calling this a coup. Like Mexico, Nicaragua came to Morales' defense with its president saying, the government of Nicaragua denounces and strongly condemns the coup d'etat that was realized today. Also, Venezuelan president Nicolas Maduro calling this a coup and also saying that rallies would be helped to defend, quote, the life of the Bolivian native people, victims of racism. But at the same time, we've seen countries like Brazil welcoming a new note. Also, people like Jeremy Corbyn, leader of the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, say, to see Morales, who along with a powerful movement has brought so much social progress forced from office by the military is appalling. I condemn this coup against the Bolivian people and stand with them for democracy, social justice, and independence. We've also seen different reactions from the United States. For example, we saw Ilhan Omar and AOC calling this a coup, also saying that the Bolivian people deserve free, fair, and peaceful election. But on the other side of that, you had Secretary of State Mike Pompeo commending the OAS and supporting a new election. We also saw Trump today say in a statement, after nearly 14 years in his recent attempts to override the Bolivian constitution and the will of the people, Morales' departure preserves democracy and paves the way for the Bolivian people to have their voices heard, I'm calling this a significant moment for democracy. Right, but with all of that said, one of the main questions is, well, what now, will we see a new vote? Who will now lead Bolivia? Right, you had Morales who actually didn't finish his third term. Following his resignation, you also saw his vice president, the Senate president, the president of the Chamber of Deputies, and the first vice president of the Senate also resigned. Right, so that is the first, second, third, and fourth in the line of succession, which on the note of succession, the next in line is actually the second vice president of the Senate, Janine Añez, who said that she would step up as a transitional president, but she also needs a quorum from the National Assembly. However, Morales is the movement for socialism party controls both houses, and Añez has been described as strongly anti-Morales. Right, so there's that part of the mess, and as far as a new election goes, under the Bolivian Constitution, elections must be held within 90 days of a constitutional crisis. Right, and should she get the transfer of power, Añez has said that she will work to hold that election. And here, there's also been a slight question of if Morales would be a part of those re-elections, but yesterday he suggested that he might not. At the same time, Morales is reportedly hiding out, but we've still seen him posting to Twitter saying things like, you never abandoned me, and I will never abandon you. And also urging his supporters to resist forming a transitional government. But yeah, ultimately that is where we are with this story. It's gonna be very interesting to see what happens from here. If you've seen other reports, there's, there's a constant mention of the power vacuum, really rightfully so. When, when things are this chaotic and there's such a big question mark, you have to wonder, will there be some sort of process that actually involves the people and order is kept? Or will we see a drastic, drastic power grab? But for right now, we'll have to wait and see. And of course, I pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts on this? And that is where I'm going to end today's show. And hey, if you like this video, let us know. Hit that like button. Also, if you're new here, you want more of these dives into the news, be sure to hit that subscribe button, tap that bell to turn on notifications. Also, if you're looking for more to watch, you can check out my latest podcast, or maybe you just missed the last Philip DeFranco show you want to catch up. You can click or tap right there to watch either of those. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.